Okay, quiet down everyone. So you know how we blew a billion dollars on this? Well, now we're gonna do it all over again. But a video game this time. Are we qualified to take on a project like this? What plans do you have? Yes, I've got a list on my laptop. Okay, let's see. It starts with our wonderful history of successes. I'm a balding guy who loves Lord of the Rings and loves MMOs. I want this game to be good. But unless Amazon makes some major changes, it's doomed. I'll explain how on this week's visit to the Copium Clinic. First, background. The film rights and production rights for The Lord of the Rings split in the late 90s. The film rights went to Miramax, more on that later. The rights to the video games and merchandise were then controlled by Middle Earth Enterprises. In the early 2000s, they made some great agreements which resulted in some massively underrated real-time strategies, The Lord of the Rings Online, and the Slam Dunk games. Seriously, these games were great. Return of the King started off with this awesome fight. They hired the actors to do the in-game voiceovers. They did unlockable interviews with them. So good. Fast forward a few years and Middle Earth Enterprises had a contract with Leiu Technologies for the Lord of the Rings MMO. Amazon Game Studios, also called AGS, struck a deal with Leiu to make the game together in 2019. That forged ahead for a couple years until Tencent purchased Leiu. In the contract between Leiu and Middle Earth Enterprises, there is a stipulation that if they were acquired, the Lord of the Rings license would be revoked. So Amazon then lost its connection to the Lord of the Rings license. Moving to August of 2022, Embracer Group, a holding company which owns licenses for multiple titles, outright purchased all of Middle Earth Enterprises for an undisclosed amount of money. Now the Embracer Group is in control of which Lord of the Rings games get the green light. Jeff Bezos is a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. According to the Wall Street Journal, he spent $250 million to get the Lord of the Rings TV rights, only then to blow it on whatever this is. Apparently, he had an unusual degree of involvement with the deal. I can't blame him. I would too if I were in his position. I think he's just a big fan, and I get that. It was announced in the middle of 2023 that Amazon had negotiated a deal directly with the Embracer Group. Unlike last time, there's no middleman, so this project is going full steam ahead. We can only guess how much they spent to broker this game licensing contract. For reference, various reports indicate Amazon spends $500 million per year on their gaming division, and that doesn't even include Twitch. Which brings us along to our next topic, Amazon Game Studios. AGS has had a troubled past with games. There's a series of cancelled projects, then there were games like The Grand Tour, which was released in January of 2020, only to be taken off the market five months later. Another example was the hero shooter Crucible, which was released May 2020, then it re-entered beta one month later due to severe lack of player interest. For example, two weeks after the game launched, they had 862 peak concurrent players. In a rare feat, they managed to get gaming news agencies and actual gamers to agree. These Amazon games were not good. AGS has three main studios, Montreal, Orange County, and San Diego. The Lord of the Rings MMO will be developed specifically by the Orange County studio, the same people behind the New World MMO. In Amazon's re-announcement for the game, they said, while the Orange County Studios Lord of the Rings game will be a rather different experience than New World, it will build upon expertise and learnings from the previous game. So let's take a look at what the studio learned from New World. To state the obvious, launch was terrible. Game-breaking exploits, dupes, and bugs. I won't bother going into that because you can watch one of the million YouTube videos about it. Even New World's most ardent supporters both acknowledge launch was atrocious. So how does Amazon feel it went? Yeah, that first week of New World launching was uh, one of the more humbling experiences I've ever had in my life. Okay, some good self-awareness about the terrible launch. I felt like game-wise, like I knew what we had and I was confident in it, but just seeing like the sheer number of players that were jumping in. Everything came to this one final moment where we unhid those servers. I was the one that got to do that and that was so cool. Oh no, they're talking about this stuff like it's good. You know, you have that dichotomy between like the stress of the game being released and millions of people watching, and at the same time, the relief of, wow, finally it's out. It was completely overwhelming, unexpected, and uh, really made the years before going into that worth it. They actually think it was a success. Based on how they're talking, you'd think they'd hit a strike. Who do you think you are? I am. Well, their bosses liked it. The game sold millions of copies. Okay, that video is a year old, what have they said more recently? Well, the very next line in Amazon's re-announcement article says, New World enjoyed strong player response and engagement upon launching in September 2021, becoming the fifth highest played game by concurrent users in Steam's history at launch. Strong player response? I guess they're not technically wrong, but their supporting arguments only talk about the player number and therefore sales of the game. They had almost a million concurrent players and lost 90% of them in the first two months. Now they have 1.5% of that remaining player population. What's the big deal? Why wouldn't they want to brag about the only pseudo success they've had? Well, it shows a lack of accountability, and that's been a consistent thread with Amazon. Here's another example. One of the many game-breaking issues in New World was the mass reporting system. 
If there were enough reports to say someone did something wrong, it didn't matter if this was true, Amazon would temporarily ban the person. The player could appeal the ban, but by the time the appeal had been responded to, the ban was usually over and the damage had been done. What damage might you ask? The best content in the game was the 50 vs 50 wars. What started happening was one side would mass report the other team, getting some of their key players banned before the war. This happened to my guild. My Kiwi buddy, who I met up with later in New Zealand, shot called from my guild. Two, three, eight, five, and nine, please he got mass reported before war by a particularly toxic guild. He missed the war and we didn't have our main shot caller. We still beat the crap out of the other guild though. Right after launch, when AGS was asked about this, here's what they said. So like Katie said, uh, we, we keep track of all those reports, like we don't throw those away or anything, uh, and they're always there to reference. Um, what we want to be careful of is basing any uh, like penalty action entirely on reports, because uh, I know there you know, have been rumors and things that players can just use reporting as a weapon against other players to ban you know, the, the company leader of another company right before a war or something. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. and and. Um, one of the reasons why it takes a little bit longer to get uh, bots out of the world is because we don't just base it off of reports. So that's a straight up lie. Whether he was told to say that or not, it doesn't matter. Eventually it got so bad that they had to readdress it a few months later. I remember some of the wars, you know, would happen and all of a sudden people would be screaming, oh, we got mass reported or we're, you know, that group got mass reported. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that situation, about mass reporting? Is it a thing? Is it not a thing? How does that work? Yeah, so it is a thing. Yeah, and unfortunately, there are uh, bad actors and especially can happen in company PVP type situations where players will mass report other players and try to troll them or get them kicked out of the game. So that shouldn't be an issue. It, it never should be an issue. But mistakes happen and it, it has happened before uh, where someone is just like, they got reported, it might, it, it must happen. Now we get some truth. If you notice though, they didn't actually say how they fixed the problem. Eventually the player population declined so much that mass reporting might not even be possible anymore. There was zero accountability or ownership of the problem. Going back to what this guy said, maybe he didn't really know. They seemed pretty overwhelmed, especially at launch. Either way you look at it though, it's bad. Either they knew about the mass reporting and were lying, or they were too incompetent to understand the coding of their own product. They just saw the dollar signs from the initial purchases. Although, when I say they, I guarantee the frontline developers didn't get a dime from sales. You can look at AGS Orange County job postings and there's nothing in there about bonuses based on game sales. Also an article from Bloomberg written about AGS essentially confirms this from their internal sources. The leadership are the ones who are often incentive based. Let's see who they credit the game launch to. Looks like their leadership. John Dvorak, business operations director. Looks like he's still head of BizOps. Good for he him. And he went to UCI for business school. Zatzat. Zat. Next is Jeff Charvet, production director. Looks like he moved on a year and a half after New World launched. Now we get to the more recognizable names. Scott Lane, game director. Other than having one T in his name, Scott's a likable guy. You can tell he really wants New World to be a good game. He even has a New World tattoo. He's stuck in a tough place though. His leadership put unrealistic goals, expectations, and deadlines on him, but somehow he's supposed to bear the brunt of the fallout from decisions which ultimately weren't his. My issue with Scott being the game director for New World is his work experience, or should I say lack thereof. That's awesome. So this is your first MMO. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So your game director for an MMO has never worked on an MMO. At best, he's done some RPGs in a WWE game. With that background, it now makes sense how the vast majority of New World's issues were in the realm of player-to-player -player interaction. This was the first time he had ever encountered one of these issues. You can make the argument that he just needs to manage, and it doesn't matter if he's worked on an MMO before. The problem comes with foreseeing potential pitfalls unique to this particular genre. That was obviously an issue for New World and is likely to persist with the Lord of the Rings MMO because AGS's culture of not actually solving the main issues, but more on that later. Next guy responsible for New World's launch is studio head Richard Lawrence. He's still the head of AGS Orange County. Looks like he was previously chief technology officer for Sony. We don't know a ton about Rich. He made appearances early on with the New World dev updates, but stopped since then. He kept the Orange County studio staffed with well over 200 employees. Finally, we have the VP of Amazon Game Studio, Christoph Hartman. He previously co-founded 2K. He was promoted to head of AGS in the second half of 2022 when his predecessor stepped down. We'll come back to Christoph later. Culture, good or bad, comes from the top. The head of Amazon's game division, Mike Frazzini, had been with Amazon since its early days and was a rising star in the book division. In 2009, Jeff Bezos made him head of the gaming division. The only problem, he's not a gamer. He hadn't developed a single game and he apparently didn't play many games either. That's not great. Usually you want your division leader to know something about the products. For an article about Amazon gaming, Bloomberg sourced 30 current and former AGS employees. 
A story from the article reads, on a different occasion, the team cringed as Frazzini struggled to differentiate between hyper-polished conceptual footage and live gameplay, a sign he didn't understand the technology. The dude's not a gamer. He thought a preview was gameplay. Corroborating the story from a Wired article says, his knowledge of video games, though, it seemed thin to some. In meetings, two former employees said Frazzini would mention his love of RBI baseball. That's a game from 1987, the year I was born. Apparently, he played Quake back in 1996, but it sounds like not much since then. Somehow, he led Amazon Gaming Studios for more than a decade. Before he stepped down a little over a year ago, he set the framework and culture for all of AGS. He enforced the usual Amazon six-pager policy. This is essentially when you have a proposal, there's a certain way they want it delivered, and it's in a six-page document. While this appears to be working great for their other divisions, game design is much more of an art than a science. Former AGS employees expressed that the six-pager and other Amazon performance metrics didn't fit the nature of game development. The process is too cumbersome for the thousands of changes a game needs to undergo. Another thing that Mike Frazzini spearheaded was Amazon's own game engine, Lumberyard. Instead of using industry standards like Unity or Unreal, he wanted a proprietary Amazon engine. He then dictated every project use it, despite Lumberyard not being as good as the others. Per the Wired article, the engine was a nightmare, one former employee said. No one on the development team liked working with it. Even some basic functions like rotating a camera in-game or testing individual pieces of software one by one didn't really work. Engineers were moved off games onto Lumberyard in a process sometimes referred to as Talent Tetris. Development slowed by as much as 50%. They called it the Lumberyard Tax, one former employee said. In their most recent announcement, Amazon said they'll be using their Azoth engine for the new game. Azoth's a modified version of the Lumberyard engine. A couple problems with this. First, as I mentioned earlier, it's not industry standard to use Azoth. It's very rare to find any developers with extensive Azoth experience. When AGS is getting new talent, they'll have to be trained on how to use it. Secondly, the engine's not great. The AGS employees apparently say it's a huge headache. From the Bloomberg article, Lumberyard became a boogeyman around the office. Some features required esoteric commands to function and the system was painfully slow. Developers played Halo or watched Amazon Prime videos while waiting for Lumberyard to process art or compile code, several former employees say. A common refrain around the office, according to a former employee, Lumberyard is killing this company. Having played New World for way longer than I should have, I got to experience what the engine can make. I'm no developer, but Lumberyard doesn't optimize for large amounts of people and assets on screen at a time, as well as other engines do. The 50 vs 50 wars still have performance issues. They've done things to improve it like instance wars, remove all harvestable assets from battlefields, and they even flirted with the idea of dropping wars down to 40 vs 40. They tried to say it wasn't because performance, but come on. Unreal Engine 5 minimizes rendering demands through use of Nanite. Lumberyard doesn't even come close to this. In Amazon's re-announcement of the Lord of the Rings MMO, they say this in regards to the 50 vs 50 wars. New World enabled huge multiplayer battles at scale, which is uncommon in video games due to the sheer complexity of enabling dozens of players to seamlessly interact with the same instance. This proficiency has a clear application and relevance to Tolkien's Third Age, which famously features large-scale battles of its own. In fact, this game will give the studio a new opportunity to take much of what works so well for New World worked so well for New World. Whether they're lying or measuring success in terms of units sold, not players retained, it's bad. It shows Amazon is disconnected from what a good outcome with an MMO is. Usually when there's a big failure, heads roll. Not the case at AGS. They think what they did was a massive dub. So like I mentioned, Mike Frazzini stepped down as head of AGS after 13 years. You could say this was because of New World, but it had been out for more than a year by the time he left. And why then? Why not after any of the other failed multi-million dollar projects? His successor, who I previously mentioned, Chris Hartman, at least has a background with game development. Granted, none of them are MMOs, but he has more industry experience than his predecessor. Although he was Mr. VP during all of the New World development and launch, so he's not free from any blame. He's done a few interviews since he took over, and let's see what he's about. When talking with IGN, he said, New World was a huge, huge achievement. He goes on to say all of his goals for the Lord of the Rings MMO, and they sound great. They sound just like what they were saying about New World before launch. He continues to bury his grave with gamesindustry.biz. I'm providing a screenshot of the article so you know I'm not taking anything out of context because what he says here is wild. Only ship when you're ready, he tells gamesindustry.biz. For me, that's probably something we should have known better. You don't rush into a territory where you already have clear market leaders. We launched Crucible at a time when PUBG and Fortnite were super, super big. Okay, good. An acknowledgement of something that went wrong. That's why we had so many delays on New World. We really wanted to make sure that this time we get it right. Bruh. Oh no. 
The lack of awareness here is staggering. Assets weren't ready. Entire game systems like OPR, their battlegrounds were offline, and they didn't even acknowledge it until weeks later. But according to the head of AGS, they got it right with New World. As MMO fans, we've grown accustomed to liking delays. We think it means the developers are adding the finishing touches. Spending the appropriate amount of time developing a game is good. Leadership giving arbitrary release dates in order to squeeze more work out of their employees is bad. They delayed the launch five times. Clearly, the game wasn't in a playable state, but leadership tried to will it so. My final impression with Christoph Hartman comes from this interview with GameSpot. Ideally, we become the Disney of the future. I don't know if we get there, but it's a good approach. Oh boy. This is a nitpick, but Disney almost destroyed the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Peter Jackson had done a lot of the pre-production work when he pitched the idea to the head of Miramax. Miramax was a Disney subsidiary and was led by none other than now convicted rapist Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein didn't like the pitch. He wanted to turn it into one film and change the script to kill one of the hobbits. Peter Jackson disagreed, so Harvey Weinstein tried to torpedo the project. Thankfully, Peter Jackson was contractually allowed to pitch the idea to other studios and finally landed with New Line Cinema, which gave him a $300 million budget for all three movies. In Return of the King, the orc commander Gothmog was made to look like Harvey Weinstein. Here's Elijah Wood confirming that. And one of the orc masks was designed to look like Harvey Weinstein. <gasps> okay, back to gaming. The next major issue facing AGS with their Lord of the Rings MMO is the amount of content they deem to be acceptable. I think New World failed because of its lack of content. People could tell early on that there wasn't much to do in the world. At launch, they had two max level dungeons and no raids. In the two and a half years the game has been out, there's still one battleground map. Players were burning through the content quicker than they expected, so instead of making new stuff, AGS did things like increase the amount of experience it would take to level artisan classes. The fetch quests would send you far away, only to have you turn around and go right back to the same spot. They decreased the amount of experience gained from town boards. The content in the game was so barren, they started intentionally making it stretch out to last longer. Stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. A few months after launch, they were talking about all kinds of content we were getting. We've been hard at work to bring you guys what you want. Forget actually getting a raid back then, a decent dungeon, or heaven forbid, a new OPR map. They gave us music. It was 1700s themed Guitar Hero, a system nobody was asking for. I suspect the individual developers knew this, but were powerless because their bosses were still pointing them in the wrong direction. We're two and a half years post launch, and the only meaningful end game loop is the territory war system. Even then, you can only find the same copy pasted fortress so many times before it gets stale. This game was developed like an RPG, not an MMO. In RPGs, you progress, then at max level, there are a few extra things you can do. In MMOs, most of your time is spent at max level. MMOs have loops at the end game, different progression patterns has and activities which have a lot of replayability. Next, we are going to be talking about endgame content. Thanks. Bye. For an AGS senior level design position, in their preferred qualifications, they say game design experience in MMO or RPG games. MMO experience, great, but or RPG? These genres have some things in common, but are vastly different. It's like on the census, if they ask if you're Asian or Pacific Islander, why are these two things together? So have you worked on an MMO before? I helped on a mobile game RPG once. You're hired. I think part of this goes back to even how your head game director, Scott, had never worked on an MMO. Wouldn't that be ridiculous for MMO studios to ask for MMO experience on their job list well, other studios are doing it. Designing an MMO without any real MMO experience is like designing a car without having driven one. You understand the basic concepts, but you overlook potential fatal flaws because you don't know what you don't know. Back to the re-release announcement, they said, the Orange County Studios will build upon expertise and learnings from the previous game, which is New World. AGS hasn't shown that they've learned the right lessons. A couple months after launch, they said this in a dev discussion. We fixed more than a 700 defects. Wow, okay. For this build alone. Mm -hmm. There were 225 tasks that were improvements. Okay. And that's a good bump. Yeah. yeah. Please clap. Players don't care about the number of bugs you've fixed. That's like turning in a bad homework assignment and telling your teacher, yeah, I got an F, but you should have seen it before. Scott Lane says part of his day-to-day -day schedule includes bug counts. A lot of meetings with the creative leaders. Uh, a lot of planning, going through bug counts. That reeks of corporate overlord metrics. This causes the AGS employees to be more concerned about the process than the result. If your boss tells you the most important thing is the number of bugs fixed, then you'll prioritize the bugs that are easiest to fix, not the ones that are most impactful on gameplay. That would explain why some really bad bugs lasted for a long time. As gamers, we can excuse bugs temporarily if the core content is good. But like I said, New World didn't have any core in the game content. The closed alpha lasted nine-ish months, but the only end game content to test during alpha came in the last two months. That's not nearly enough time to get the loops engineered properly. But AGS leadership said, Time. What time do you think we have? 
and rushed the deadline so they could stroke their openness. The closed beta lasted two weeks and the open beta was three days. I suspect they kept the testing period short because they didn't want people to expose their lack of content in copy-pasted cities. Instead of taking New World to learn from, they shot themselves in the foot by once again burning the trust of the gaming community. We're now well aware of the type of games AGS puts out and what they think is acceptable. As my boss at Fry's Electronics used to tell us when I was in high school, don't just come at me with problems, have a solution in mind. So what can Amazon do to make sure their Lord of the Rings MMO doesn't flop? In order to actually solve a problem, you have to first recognize it as a problem. The most glaring issue is that they don't actually think New World was a failure. Whether the higher-ups are patting them on the back for all the unit sales or it's some kind of self-esteem defense mechanism, they seem satisfied with how the game went. If they instead took the approach of saying, hey, we recognize this game wasn't what we promised it would be. We owe our customers much more. That would work wonders. Gamers generally respond to heartfelt messages as long as they're followed up with good content. Instead, they lied about their screw-ups and now they're acting like their screw-ups were great achievements. So First, own your mistakes and stop with this revisionist historian nonsense. Second, get developers and leadership who are MMO players and give them financial incentives for the game they're working on. Don't just hire RPGers. The people who have spent thousands of hours playing endgame loops might know a thing or two about how to incorporate them into your game, which leads me to my next point. Third, plan for insane amounts of content. New World didn't and still doesn't have half as much content as an MMO should. It doesn't seem like you guys at AGS grasp that. Adding one dungeon every eight months doesn't count as adequate content. You should have tons of game loops with deep progression pathways and customization. Also, have expansion content preloaded and ready to go because when you're overwhelmed with bugs and exploits at launch, you'll be able to give your players something to look forward to through all the mayhem. Fourth, stop launching early. Your testing for New World wasn't adequate. All of your problems at launch could have been resolved if you had tested more. With more content, you won't be scared to have longer testing periods. Fifth and final solution, open your development process. This would be a show of good faith. You don't have to tell us everything, but give us a peek into your design decisions. You might be surprised by how the MMO community will respond to this. The collective knowledge and experience of MMO players could be a great resource to tap into if you're looking for feedback on a particular system. It's a lot easier to fix things early in development than two months before launch, although you already know that, I hope. Can Amazon get out of their own way or they force another early release? I mean, I hope they can pull it off, but their history proves otherwise. If they were going to make a good MMO, they would have done it by now. I'll finish with this segment. AAA studios haven't been doing so hot lately. Their focus on monetization over gameplay has cost them dearly. Indie studios, on the other hand, have been killing it. Passionate developers who aren't bound by six-page memos are outperforming their big-budgeted counterparts in all kinds of ways. As MMO fans, we've been kicked in the nuts for the past 15 years. Despite what Redditors tell you, it's okay to hope for a good game. In terms of good MMOs on the horizon, Pax Day seems promising, but their monetization has me concerned. I think Ashes of Creation has the most potential. Now I know a lot of you are getting ready to make your Star Citizen 2.0 and 2035 release date comments. That's fine. Doubting a project with this much potential puts you in great company with Harvey Weinstein. He'd probably agree with you. Also, it's a self-owned because Star Citizen uses Lumberyard. I'm not going to try to sell you on Ashes now. I could tell you about how it's being developed by a team of over 200 MMO gamers and that it's not going to be rushed out, but that's what the rest of my channel is for. If you've made it this far in the video, why not subscribe? I'm going to be covering this Lord of the Rings MMO to see if Amazon makes any steps in the right direction. And of course, I'll keep covering Ashes of Creation. Thanks for watching and be careful with Copium. It's highly addictive.